Can I just say, it's about fucking time I talked at the Oxford Union. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to go in front of the lectern. Um, the, the, the genesis of um, this new book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, I think probably began in a previous book of mine called The Psychopath Test. Um, and in The Psychopath Test, at one point, I went on a psychopath spotting course um, uh, run by Robert Hare, who's the uh, father of modern psychopathy. And I am now a certified in that I have a certificate of attendance um, and very adept psychopath spotter. So I was wondering what I should do with my new psychopath spotting skills. And I thought, I won't put them to philanthropic good. Uh, what I'll do is think about all the people in my past who had crossed me to see which of them I could out as psychopaths. Um, so obviously, first on the bill was A.A. Uh, a. Gill, uh, who had just written, a, um, who had just written a, a column in the Sunday Times about how he'd shot a baboon on safari because, like all of us, he wondered what it'd be like to shoot a person, which is classic psychopath. Um, <laughs> Also, he always gives my television documentaries very bad reviews, which is classic psychopath. <laughs> By the way, when I'm not excitedly using the acoustics of the room, and I, can, you, can you still hear me? Yeah. Is the sound OK? Yeah. That's good. Um, by the way, I bumped into a girl quite recently at, a, at an award ceremony, came bounding over to me and said, uh, I hear I'm in your book about psychopaths. Don't worry, I would never sue another journalist. So I said, you know how you wrote uh, that column about shooting a baboon on safari because, like all of us, you wondered what it'd be like to shoot a person? I said, it's not all of us. It's not a normal thing to think. <laughs> it's just you. <laughs> so he said, well, you don't hunt, so you wouldn't understand. So I said, I sell more books than you do. <laughs> so I won. Anyway, Robert Hare said to me, really what you should do is, is tell the story of corporate psychopathy. He said, this is the biggest story in the world and nobody's interested, nobody's thinking about this, but it's the solution to all the great mysteries, why the wars, why the economic injustice, corporate psychopaths, because psychopathy is such a powerful brain anomaly, it's actually remoulded society all wrong because all those items on the checklist like lack of remorse and grandiosity they're all rewarded by our out of control system he said you should try and get yourself some corporate psychopaths to interview so so i tried i wrote to bernie madoff and i said can i come and interview you to find out if you're a psychopath um and he he didn't write back um <laughs> So then I changed tack. I wrote to a famous asset stripper called Chainsaw Al Dunlap, who was famous in the 90s for always firing. He'd go into a failing business and he'd, and he'd shut down 30% of the factories and he'd always fire people with a joke. Like one time somebody said to him, I've just bought myself a new car. And he said, you may have a new car, but I'll tell you what, you don't have a job. Um, in fact, when Fast Company magazine wrote an article of the 50 worst corporate psychopaths of all time. He was the only one on the list who was still alive. Um, so I wrote to him, changing tack. I said, I believe that you may have a very special brain anomaly that makes you fearless and interested in the predatory spirit. Can I come and interview you about your special brain anomaly? <laughs> and he said, come on over. So <laughs> I went to our Dunlap's palatial Florida mansion, which was filled with sculptures and paintings of predatory animals. Um, there you go. Um, and he gave me a tour of his gardens. He said, over there you've got lions and, and leopards. He was saying this in a less effeminate way. Uh, <laughs> tigers. I said, um, it's like Midas and the Queen of Narnia uh, flew over a very fierce zoo and then turned everything to stone and dropped everything here. <laughs> and he said, what? And <laughs> I said, nothing. And <laughs> I said, it was just a jumble of words that became confused in my mouth. And he said, okay. So then we went into his kitchen and it was our 
his second wife, uh, June, and his bodyguard, Sean. So I said, do you know how I said in my email that you may have a very special brain anomaly that makes you interested in the predatory spirit? And he said, yeah, it's an amazing theory. It's like Star Trek. You're going where no man has gone before. And I said, well, <clears throat> I said, some psychiatrists would say that this makes you a <laughs> um, He said, a what? And I said, I said, a psychopath. And in fact, I have a list of, uh, I have a checklist of psychopathic character traits in my pocket. Can I go through the list with you? And I think what saved me is that Al Dunlap, like all of us, loves nothing more than a mental health checklist. So <laughs> he said, OK. So I, I got out the list and I said, item one, grandiose sense of self-worth, which would have been a hard one for him to deny because he was standing underneath a giant oil painting of himself. <laughs> um, he said, well, you've got to believe in you. And, uh, <laughs> I said, cunning manipulative. He said, that's leadership. I, I said, shallow affect. He said, who wants to be weighed down with some nonsense emotions? I said, lack of remorse. He said, why drown yourself in sorrow? So he was going down the, uh, the list, redefining many of the items as business positives. And, but I did notice something happening to me the day that I was at Al Dunlap's house, which was every time he said something that wasn't psychopathic, I thought, well, that's OK. I won't put that in my book. So he said no to many short-term marital relationships. He's only been married twice. Admittedly, his first marriage ended when he threatened his first wife with a knife and said he always wondered what human flesh tasted like. But <laughs> his second marriage lasted 41 years, and they were very happy, and there was no... Um, there's no um, evidence of any kind of extramarital activity or anything like that. So he said no to that. He said no to juvenile delinquency and early behaviour problems. He said he got accepted into West Point and they don't let delinquents into West Point. So whenever he said any of this stuff, I thought, well, that's OK. I won't put that in the book. And then I realised that becoming a psychopath spotter had kind of turned me a little bit psychopathic in my desire to just shove... Al Dunlap into a box marked psychopath to kind of define him by his outermost edges. And when I got back to London, I had dinner with a friend of mine, who some of you will know, uh, the documentary maker Adam Curtis. And he said, well, it's what we all do, isn't it? As journalists, we go around the world with our notepads in our hands and we wait for the gems. And the gems are always the outermost aspects of that person's personality and like medieval tapestry maker we makers we stitch together the gems and we leave all the normal stuff on the floor and adam said you know we all know that what we do is odd but we don't like thinking about it and of course adam's absolutely right that's what we do and and later on in fact i met a woman who had who'd got this down to a fine art she was a guest booker for the kinds of daytime TV shows where everybody yells at each other. And she told me that she had a secret trick that she would utilise when deciding which guests to book. And the secret trick was that she would ask them what medication they were on. And if it was a, she said, if it was a kind of scary sounding medication like lithium, she wouldn't have them on the show because you don't want them to go on the show and then go off and kill themselves. But if it was a medication that implied a kind of fun sounding mental illness, like, <laughs> like Prozac, that's perfect. Prozac is the, exactly the right medication to imply the right sort of mental illness to be entertaining for us on daytime television because it implies that they're a little bit crazier than we are, so we feel fine, we feel a little bit better about our own craziness. We can watch them and think, oh, OK, we're not quite as bad as them, but they're not so crazy that we feel bad, like we want, she said, we want smoke and mirrors exploitation, we don't want actual exploitation. Um, and you know, it didn't always work, though, because one time they did a programme called My Boyfriend is Bodybuilder Crazy or something. So they had the bodybuilder on and he did the whole Charles Atlas and then he went off and everybody was like laughing at him. And then the next day he, he phoned her up and while he was on the telephone to her, he slit his wrists. So because, of course, he had body dysmorphic dysfunction. Um, so I would go around the world in about 2011, 2012, telling these stories about labelling out of control, about this proclivity in journalism and in the worst, uh, in the worst excesses of psychiatry and psychology to just define people by, by their labels and so on. And I would tell another story about 
a little girl called Rebecca Riley, who was a four-year-old girl in Massachusetts, who was labelled bipolar because she had temper tantrums, which meant that she scored high on the bipolar checklist. So at the age of, I think, three, she was put on antipsychotic medication for her temper tantrums, and she was given an overdose of her medication, and, and she died. So, and I know that these are extreme stories, but they're extreme stories about something very real that's happening in America, this kind of, this, this sort of zest for defining people by their outermost aspects. And I would go around the world, tell these stories, and everybody would agree that it's bad, like that everything I've just said is bad. And then I noticed that we would all then go home and do exactly the same thing on social media. We would uh, take somebody's tweet as like, a clue to their secret inner evil, like some poor phraseology in a tweet became like evidence that that person wasn't like us, that person was a very bad person. And, I, and the kind of hypocrisy of it started to kind of rankle with me a little bit. It's like when the people abusing their power are over there, we love it, but when we're the ones abusing our power, it's like, Jesus, you know, keep away. Um, so I wanted to write a book about that, and, and I'm going to tell a story from, from the book. Um, of course, in the early days of social media, it wasn't that way. It was a place of curiosity and compassion. People would admit hitherto shameful secrets about themselves, and other people would say, oh my God, I'm exactly the same. And, and out of that, shared levelling of the playing field, voiceless people having a voice, being compassionate and curious about each other, came something else, came social justice, came a, a very powerful and effective and likeable type of social justice. When a powerful person misused their privilege, we could do something about it, we could get them. If a corporation did something wrong, we could get them. We knew something that they didn't know. We had this power of a social justice shaming. But I think what started to happen after that was that we started to fall in love with shaming so much that a day without a shaming felt kind of weird and empty, like there wasn't, when there wasn't somebody who had misused their privilege that we could get, it felt like a day kind of picking fingernails or treading water. And into this rather hostile atmosphere stumbled an unsuspecting woman called Justine Sacco. Now, Justine had 170 Twitter followers, and she would tweet, she was a PR woman in New York, and she'd tweet little acerbic jokes to them, like this one on a plane from... New York to London. Uh, I'm probably going to have to read these out, right? Yeah. Okay. We are German, dude. You're in first class. It's 2014. Get some deodorant. In a monologue as I inhale BO. Thank God for pharmaceuticals. So Justine chuckled to herself and pressed send and got no replies and felt that sad feeling that we all feel when the internet doesn't congratulate us for being funny. <laughs> We think, what is the point of surrounding ourselves with, on Twitter with people who feel exactly the same way we do if they don't congratulate us for our <laughs> funny joke about the man on the plane? <laughs> and then she got to Heathrow, and she had a little bit of time to kill before her final leg, which was from Heathrow to Cape Town, and she thought up another acerbic little joke and tweeted it to her 170 Twitter followers. Going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white. So she chuckled to herself, press send, got no replies. I met her a couple of weeks later and I asked her, were you surprised that, that you didn't get any replies? And she said, nobody ever replied to my jokes. She got on the plane, turned off her phone, fell asleep, woke up 11 hours later, turned on her phone, and straight away there was a text from somebody she hadn't spoken to since high school that said, I am so sorry to see what's happening to you right now. And then another text from my best friend, you need to call me right now, you are the worldwide number one trending topic on Twitter. So while she'd slept, one of her 170 followers tweeted the joke to a Gorka journalist called Sam Biddle, and he retweeted it to his 15,000 followers, and that's how it began. And now a funny holiday joke from IAC's PR bus. Later on, I asked Sam Biddle how it had felt to have started the campaign against Justine, and he said it felt delicious. And then he said, but I'm sure she's fine. 
but she wasn't fine because while she was asleep in the air and completely oblivious, Twitter took control of her life and dismantled it. So first came the philanthropists. If Justin Sacco's unfortunate words about AIDS bothers you, join me in supporting CARE's work in Africa. In light of Justin Sacco's disgusting racist tweet, I am donating to CARE today. Then came the beyond horrified. Really have no words for that horribly disgusting racist as fuck tweet from Justin Sacco. I am beyond horrified. Was anybody on Twitter that night? You were. So Justin's tweet obviously overwhelmed your timeline. Yeah. <laughs> the same way that it did mine. And, and I thought what everybody else thought that night, which was, wow, somebody's fucked. And I kind of uh, <laughs> sat up in bed and put the pillow behind my head. And, <laughs> and then I thought, after I've got to say a, a few seconds, I thought, I'm not convinced that that tweet was intended to be racist. There is a comedic tradition of people acknowledging their own privilege and then mocking it is what Randy Newman does very well in, in, in his songs. Maybe this came from that comedic tradition. It might have been a very, very bad example of that comedic tradition, but maybe that was a tradition. When I met her a couple of weeks later, I asked her to explain the joke. Uh, and she said, living in America puts us in a bit of a bubble when it comes to what is going on in the third world. I was making fun of that bubble. Um, but she never got a chance to explain the joke because she was asleep when everything that I'm about to tell you happened. So it started to get darker. Everyone go report this cunt. Good luck, good luck with the job hunt in the new year. Hashtag getting fired. Thousands of people around the world decided it was their duty to get Justine fired. Last tweet of your career. Hashtag sorry not sorry. Corporations got involved, hoping to sell their products on the back of Justine's annihilation. Next time you plan to tweet something stupid before you take off, make sure you're getting on a go-go flight. You know, a lot, of <laughs> a lot of companies were making good money that night. Um, an internet economist I spoke to estimated that Google, because she was normally Googled 40 times a month, but that night and for a few nights afterwards, she was Googled 1,220,000 times. Um, and somebody estimated for me that that meant that Google made somewhere between 120 and $468,000 from the annihilation of Justin Sacco, whereas those of us doing the actual shaming, we got nothing. It's like we were kind of unpaid shaming interns for Google and Twitter. <laughs> then came the trolls. I'm actually kind of hoping Justin Sacco gets AIDS, lol. Somebody else that night wrote, Somebody HIV positive should rape this bitch and then we'll find out if her skin colour protects her from AIDS. And guess how many people went after that person? Nobody. That person got a free pass. Everybody was so excited about destroying Justine. And our shaming brains are so simple-minded. We couldn't handle also destroying somebody who was inappropriately destroying Justine. On Twitter that night, we were like toddlers crawling towards a, a gun. When a woman gets shamed, it's always much worse than when a man gets shamed. When a man gets shamed, it's I'm going to get you fired. When a woman gets shamed, it's I'm going to rape you, I'm going to cut out your uterus, and I'm going to get you fired. You demented bitch. Retarded, racist bitch. And then Justine's employers got involved. This is an outrageous, offensive comment. Employee in question, currently unreachable on an international flight. And that's when the anger turned to excitement because suddenly everybody realised that we knew something that Justine didn't. We knew she was being destroyed. All I want for Christmas is to see Justine Sacco's face when her plane lands and she checks her inbox voicemail. Oh man, Justine Sacco is going to have the most painful phone turning on moment ever when her plane lands. We were about to watch this Justine Sacco bitch get fired in real time before she even knows she's being fired. Well, bitch, how does it feel to be fired for Christmas? Somebody worked out exactly which plane she was on, so they linked to a flight tracker website so everybody could watch its progress in real time. And then a hashtag started trending worldwide. Hashtag has Justine landed yet? It's kind of wild to see someone self-destruct without them even being aware of it. 
Hashtag has just been landed yet. Seriously, I just want to go home and go to bed, but everyone at this bar is so into has Justine landed yet? Can't look away, can't leave. Hipsters. Justine was really uniting a lot of disparate groups that night, from the genuinely upset through to raper through to hipsters. <coughs> has Justine landed yet? Maybe the best thing to ever happen to my Friday night. Right, is there no one in Cape Town going to the airport to tweet her arrival? Come on, Twitter, I'd like pictures. And guess what? Yep, Justine Saku has in fact landed at Cape Town International. She's decided to wear sunnies as a disguise. And if you want to know what it looks like to have just discovered that you, are that you have been torn apart for a misconstrued liberal joke and your life will never be the same again, you'll be fired from your job, you'll have death threats, you'll have rape threats, you'll be followed to the gym by the newspapers, who, by the way, are pathetically grateful for every time there's a public shaming. The mainstream media is like the nerdy kids sucking up to the, to the bully. You know, I was raised as a journalist to, to not be afraid of people misusing their power, speaking truth to power. But when the people speaking truth to power is on social media, the mainstream media is afraid and pathetically grateful. If you want to know, oh, and if you want to know what it looks like, then after a year in the wilderness, you finally get another job, and then Twitter finds out and decides to try and get you fired all over again. That's what it looks like. Anyway, my, my book came out uh, in hardback about 10 months ago, and the first thing that happened was um, the New York Times did run an extract of the uh, Justine Sacco um, story, and it kind of went a little bit crazy. I'm, I'm going to read a, a little bit. I wrote a new chapter for the afterword of the paperback about what happened um, after the book came out, so I'm going to read a little bit, and then hopefully there'll be some questions. My American publisher sent me a box of Christmas cookies at Christmas with a card that read, Get some rest. 2015 is going to be a bumpy year. I emailed him to ask what he meant. He replied that some people were going to hate the book. Oh, nobody's going to hate it, I thought. How could they? I'm right. <laughs> Condemnation began hesitantly at first, a little uncertain, like a consensus waiting to form. That New York Times article did nothing but bring her back into the spotlight when we'd all moved on, somebody tweeted. Her dad is a billionaire, someone replied. I'm not too worried about her. This is something that came up a lot on the night of her destruction. Let us not be fooled by Justin Sacco. Her father is a South African mining billionaire. She's not sorry and neither is her father. People miss the point that Justin Sacco grew up daughter of a white billionaire in South Africa. She doesn't care about losing a job, serial offender. Her father's not a billionaire. Her father sells carpets, but we need to dehumanise the people that we destroy. It's because we want to destroy people but not feel bad about it, so we call them a sociopath, or we call them the daughter of a billionaire. We know this from history. We want to destroy people but not feel bad about it. Condemnation began hesitantly at first. Oh, I read that bit, I'm sorry. Um, that tweet didn't ruin her life, someone added. Justine Saku has a new job. Give me a break already. After a year, I thought when I read that one. She got a new job after a year. Nice people like us had effectively sentenced Justine to a year's punishment for the crime of some poor phraseology in a tweet, as if some clunky wording had been a clue to her secret inner evil. The fact that she doggedly pulled things back together after a year was now being used as evidence that the shaming had been no big deal from the start. I remember the time I was on a beach in Scotland and a flock of terns singled me out. They circled above me for a while and then began to dive bomb, pecking at my head. This early tentative disapproval felt like the terns circling and then the dive bombing began. After reading that excerpt from his book, I think it's safe to say John Ronson is a fucking racist. A group of Chelsea football fans were filmed on the Paris Metro pushing a black man off the train and chanting, we're racist, we're racist, and that's the way we like it. It was a shocking, awful video. Somebody wrote, maybe John Ronson will cape up for them. I decided to try and encourage those people to read the book, and so I tweeted, 
By the way, the Justine Sacco story in the New York Times isn't a standalone article. It's an extract from a book. Oh, now Ronson's saying it's an extract from a book, someone wrote. What did that mean? It was always an extract from a book. <laughs> Do you think I ran home and quickly wrote a book? <laughs> but anything I said in that moment, I realised, would just be more evidence for the prosecution, and so I went back to being silent. Why isn't John Ronson replying to any of us? Someone tweeted. <laughs> because John Ronson only replies to men, someone replied. <laughs> I liked it when people went for me in ridiculous ways because when I recounted those comments to other people, they made me look good. <laughs> I visited a TV studio in New York to film a video about the book. There was a doctor on before me filming her own video. What's your book about, she asked me. Online shaming, I said. Oh, did you read that piece in the New York Times, she said. <laughs> I wrote it, I said. Oh, you must be so happy, she said. Actually, I'm not, I said. Why not, she said. Because there's a backlash with people calling me a racist, I said. So what do you want, she said. Xanax, I said. <laughs> she got out her pad and wrote me a prescription for 60 Xanax. <laughs> After that, I was no longer anxious. <laughs> but I felt groggy. I had to weigh up whether to feel groggy or anxious. <laughs> Later, I mentioned this to the comedian, Joe Rogan. Welcome to America, he wrote. He said to me, that's our dilemma, groggy or anxious. <laughs> Thank you. I just, there was just one thing I, I also wanted to, to read. Um, it's about a, a, another shaming that happened after the book came out. And, and, I, and, and like Justine, this person was accused of misusing their privilege. And I just wanted to, to read out this line. The phrase misuse of privilege was becoming a free pass to tear apart pretty much anybody we chose to. It was becoming a devalued term and was making us lose our capacity for empathy and for distinguishing between serious and unserious transgressions. Oh, Peroni. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that, John. Um, you said that you were interested in writing about the abuse of power um, as a result of this uh, on social media, but it's also something that unites your other work as well. Um, what is it that draws you to this topic in general? I, I, honestly, I think I'm really interested in, in bubbles, like bubbles of irrationality, um, because they're mysterious to me and I want to try and understand things I don't understand. So why do people behave in these you know, inexplicable ways. And I was particularly interested in this one because, um, you know, usually the, the abuse of the power rights battle a long way over there, but suddenly this was us abusing our power. And to me, that was a much richer story than, than some of the other ones I've written about in the past, because it's so close to home. And, and you know, who would have thought that um, it would have such a ferocious response when it, when it came out? I, I suppose who would have thought that a book that's critical of public shaming on social media would then be publicly shamed on social media? Well, indeed. I was, I was wondering, do you fear being publicly shamed after every interview you give or every book you write or every statement you make? Yeah. It's, it's very... In, until you've been on the end of it, I don't know if anybody here has had a public shaming, until you've been on the end of it... And, of course, mine is very minor compared to... To, to a lot of other people, but because you know most people, you know, liked and understood and got the joke. But no, it's it's very it's very traumatizing. It's very debilitating. It's extremely hurtful. The Gorka journalist said, "I'm sure she's fine." People aren't fine. It's it's a very traumatic thing to happen to you. It's um, actually it's funny. Um, another shamey, Mike Daisy, uh, said. This is how he described it. I love I loved his description of what it's like to be on the end of a shaming. He said, it feels like they want an apology, but that's a lie. They don't want an apology. What they want is my destruction. They want me to die. They will never say this because it's too histrionic, but they want to never hear from me again. And while they're never hearing from me again, they want the right to use me as a cultural reference point whenever it services their ends. That's how it would work out best for them. And then he said, I'd never had the opportunity of being an object of hate before. The hard part isn't the hate, it's the object. And of course, what that means is that kind of 
slubby white men like Mike Daisy and me are learning for the first time what it feels like to be objectified, which I guess is progress of sorts, but, um, <laughs> but may maybe it's not. So is there no good way to respond? Should you just Oh no, I think, no, I mean, I think a lot about this. It, it, when it happens, like if, if 100,000 people are suddenly screaming at you, if you're not prepared for it, there's one woman in my book called Lindsay Stone who was a carer who worked with adults with learning difficulties who just made a, a douchey joke. And she read every single tweet, every single Facebook comment, you know, attacking her. And she went from being a, a carer working at home in Massachusetts to not leaving her house for a year and a half. Anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts. Um, I think if you feel, honestly, I think if, if you feel like you haven't done anything wrong, if you feel like your punishment is massively disproportionate, fight back. Because if you're not, you're, 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 you're being cowed. You're just sort of feeding the outrage machine. If you have done something wrong, then apologise immediately. Don't bury yourself in a bigger hole. And then it's probably a good idea to go silent for a couple of years. It seems a problem with Justine Sacco is that she couldn't respond in any way. Uh, no. That seems well, she even more grossly unfair. Yeah, I mean, she was oblivious. She was asleep on a plane and completely oblivious. And that was hilarious to people. You know, the, the, her obliviousness to the situation was hilarious to people. It was the wind behind the shaming sails. Imagine if that was an actual courtroom. So is Twitter beyond saving in that regard? I think Twitter's got real problems. You know, one, one thing that happened as a result of, of, of my kind of mini shaming after the book came out was somebody set up a, a fake John Ronson Twitter account in which I was praising... Dylan Roof, the, the man who murdered nine people in South Carolina. And so I, for the first and only time ever, I complained to Twitter. And Twitter wrote back and said, this is not in violation of our impersonation policy. And I thought, oh my God, we are unpaid shaming interns for a company that does not care about us. Mm. But do you think it's just a problem with Twitter, though? Oh, I mean, no, no, no. If you look at the YouTube comments, I mean, they are famously... Yeah. Um, horrendous. And, and this is a story about people. This is a story about our, you know, how, how close we are to becoming you know, brutal. Mm. It's a story about us. So it's human behaviour that's the problem. Yeah, I, I, and, and the fact that you know, the worst aspects of our behaviour are being massaged by the Twitter technology. The fact that Twitter is a, is a feedback loop. It's, it's, you know, we, we surround ourselves with people who feel the same way we do, and we approve each other. And if anybody gets in the way of that, if any kind of destabilising factor gets in the way, like Justine Sacco, we just scream them out. And that's not... You know, tech utopians like to think of this as a new sort of democracy, but actually that's the, that's the opposite of democracy. Um, what that is, you know, we, one of the ironies is that we see ourselves as non-conformist people, but this is creating a very conformist world where we are defining the boundaries of normality by tearing apart the people on the outside of it. And I should say, none of this, I don't want any of this to be misinterpreted as me saying I want to call for, you know, a, a return to offensive language, because of course I, I don't think that. I'm a, I'm a politically correct person, for want of a better Term. But, you know, we're creating a fearful society. Um, Lindsay Stone, the woman who I mentioned with the carer who made a joke, I, I set her up with this um, reputation management company called reputation.com where if you're, like, very, very rich, you can pay them hundreds of thousands of dollars and they will bury your transgression by flooding Google with positive blogs that then bury your transgression on a place where nobody looks like page two of the Google search results. And, <laughs> and, um, and it was very sad to watch that happen because do you know what they did with Lindsay? Lindsay just made this silly, audacious, you know, douchey joke, which really meant nothing. Um, they wrote all these fake Lindsay Stone blogs about how much she loved cats and ice cream and how much she was looking forward to Lady Gaga's forthcoming jazz album. So, you know, I, and I thought, my God, is this the world that we're creating where the smartest way to survive is to be bland or silent? Mm. So do you therefore think a, a good policy is... Or well, do you agree with the right to be forgotten, basically? Yeah, uh, before I... Like, as a journalist, obviously, my, my knee-jerk thing would be against the right to be forgotten, but after taking this, this journey, I, I am supportive. So you very much stuff. changed your opinion? Yeah. Because, I, you know, I, it's funny, I said to my friend Clive Stafford-Smith the other day, I've, I've gone from being, like, a, over my career, I've gone from being, like, a 
prosecution attorney to a defence attorney. And, you know, defence attorneys believe that people shouldn't be, you know, judged solely by the worst thing that they ever did. Um, you know, the, the awful thing about Twitter is how it's created this kind of stage for constant artificial high dramas, where everybody's either a kind of magnificent hero or a horrific villain. But we know that's not true about our fellow humans. What's true is that we're grey areas. Mm. And that's was final question from me before opening out to the audience. But um, with Twitter potentially getting rid of the 140 character limit, do you think that's going to have any impact on this? Or it's just longer abuse. I mean, I guess it, I mean, it waits to be seen. I, I suppose one negative aspect of the 140 character limit is that you know, the most outrageous, pithy um, expression of outrage does the best. Uh, so, you know, people who are very good at being outraged in a very um, sharp um, black and white way kind of win because of the character limit. It's a sound bites, I suppose. Yeah. You know, those of us who, who favour ambiguity and nuance and context are kind of, kind of fucked. And uh, it's, so who knows? We'll see. What a, what a time to be alive. Right. Um, so any questions from the audience? And please, uh, when I do select you, just uh, wait for the microphone to come round to you. Are you uh, going to select them? Well, I mean, you can. If you no, 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 I want you to. I get very overwhelmed if two hands go up at once. OK. So. <laughs> I always right. think I'd make a terrible Sophie in Sophie's Choice. I'd, I'd go like, <laughs> kill both my children. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so if you have a question, please raise your hand high in the air. Um, maybe. So uh, the lady on the edge there, yeah, just behind you, Alice. Um, hello. Hi. Uh, um, hi. Well, in your book, you said that the best kind of scandal that you can hope to get in is sex scandal, whereas uh, like more than a decade ago, that could be possibly the worst that could ever happen to anyone. Do you, do you, what do you think, what makes that change? Um. I mean, it's, it's, it's tricky because being... Because obviously, you know, there are, there are pockets of horrendousness. It's true that if you're, a sex, if you're in a sex scandal, particularly if you're a man in a consensual sex scandal, it's fine, nothing bad will happen to you. Uh, I feel very sorry for um, the, the men who... Oh, excuse me. The, um, the men who committed suicide for being uh, on the Ashley Madison list, if they had waited they would have found out that actually it would all, you know, it all died down quite quickly. Um, I think the expectation of the shaming for the men on the Ashley Madison list was, was more frightening than, than, than the reality. Um, I mean, I, I, when you asked that question, the two things that popped into my head were, um, if you're a feminist writer being um, turned upon by misogynistic trolls, that's relentless and awful, and certainly the range of insults is completely appalling. And also, if you're somebody who is perceived to have misused their privilege, like Justine or lots of other people I can mention, that th the problem with that one is that it's very kind of widespread. If you're a feminist writer being attacked by trolls, it's quite limited and kind of everybody knows who the goody and the baddie is in that situation. Whereas with Justine, everybody went after her, like everyone. She united everybody. Nobody was supporting her. Uh, a friend of mine, a woman I really admire called Helen Lewis, who's a writer for the New Statesman, uh, wrote a review of my book and she said that she was on Twitter that night and she kind of tentatively wrote, I'm not sure that that joke was intended to be racist or I'm not sure Justin Sacco deserves what she's getting. And she said straight away she got a kind of fury of tweets along the lines of, well, you're just a privileged bitch too. And so to her shame, she wrote, she just, she remained silent. You said something quite interesting there. You said if the men in the Ashley Madison scandal had waited, they would have seen that it died down quite quickly. Is there any way of predicting how quickly something will die down or how long it will continue? Or is that entirely based on the reaction from the actual person? That's interesting. You know, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know. I mean, sometimes it feels like never ending, like relentless. And I think it's ironic that when we watch courtroom dramas, who do we identify with? The, the kind hearted defence attorney, like the Dean Strangs, but give us, give us the power, give us the power, we become like the hanging judges. It's, it's relentless. Even somebody from, I mean, they were kind of joking, but um, I got into a bit of an online spat recently with somebody from Mother Jones, which is a, you know, a wonderful liberal American magazine, because they were joking about Justine Sacco, you know, shouldn't be allowed to have another job after a year. And I'm like, what happened to the concept of re-entry? I thought we were supposed to be 
in favour of re-entry. But on social media, it's, it's like one of the things we've thrown out is the concept of rehabilitation. It's like you're, it, you're, the, the, the shamings, it, they seem to last forever. Like Mike Daisy said, they want, they want to never hear from me again and yet use me as, the, use me as a cultural reference point wherever it services their ends. You know, that kind of identity theft and the relentlessness of it. Hence the need to, for, for, the, for the right to be forgotten, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so another question from the audience, please. Um, if we could come right over here. Uh, yes, the lady with the uh, glasses, who's currently looking around. Yes, you. That's right. So what do you think we can do to move on from this? Is it the job of people not being bland or people not jumping on people for having controversial opinions or a change in software? How can we move away from the current culture that we're in? Sure. Well, I, I certainly, the, the behaviour change I'm all for is not, like I don't, you know, when my book first came out, lots of people wrote to me to say, I'm going to send this book to my children to make sure that they don't make the same mistake Justine Sacco made, to make sure that they're more careful when they tweet something in future. And I, I wrote back to a few of them and I said, look, I understand why you are saying that, but that's not really the message. That, you know, that sound, that reminds me of girls at Saturday night don't wear short skirts. That sounds like victim blaming. For, for me, the behaviour change would be the people who are doing instant, cold, judgmental piling on of people, like over and over again. Um, I think having discussions like this is going to help a lot. You know, if somebody's getting shamed and then there's some people forward, some people against, everybody's shouting at each other, and that's fine, that's way less damaging. You know, if, if you're going online and seeing some people supporting you, that's not traumatising in the same way as what happened to Justine. So I think this is, you know, you can't regulate. You can regulate against crazy death threat trolls, but you can't regulate against delightful people like us. And it was delightful people like us that destroyed Justine Sacco. It was the desire to be compassionate and to be seen to be compassionate to the people who surrounded us on Twitter that compelled hundreds of thousands of people to, to commit this profoundly uncompassionate act of destroying somebody while she was asleep on a plane. And you can't regulate against that. Thank you for your question. Um, for another question now. Um, yeah, if we could go to the lady in the, the red top in the front row. Hi. I wanted to ask specifically about the response to the New York Times article that you, that <laughs> you were talking about. Uh, what is your response to those who said you uh, mishandled Adria Richards' story, the lady at the tech convention? That, you know, that's, I, I feel very uncomfortable talking, talking about that particular thing because of reasons I don't really want to talk about. But, but what I would say is that she was very clear about how she wanted to be quoted, and I quoted her very accurately. And, and the story I felt, I, I'm going to have to explain the story to people. Um, this is a story about um, two men who are in a tech conference um, in Santa Clara, and one of them whispers something to the guy next to him, uh, some douchey Beavis and Butthead type joke about big dongles. So the woman in front turns around and takes a photograph, and then they're called, they're, they're, they're told there's been a complaint, and so they're called into an office, and they immediately understood that, you know, it was that joke that was, and they apologised, and then, you know, were, were um, shaken up because they're nerdy men, and and they weren't used to that kind of confrontation, so they left the conference. And on the way to the airport, they thought, what, what happened? What happened then? And the, obviously the nightmare scenario was that the complaint was communicated in the form of a public tweet, which is what it turned out to be. Um, and, then on, and then the following day or, or two days later, one of them was fired from his job. So that night, he posted a message on Hacker News um, uh, which is like a, I don't know, some kind of message, techie message board. And that alerted an awful lot of men's rights activists and 4chan type people to the story. And they relentlessly went after the woman. Uh, and she got rape threats and death threats and photographs of beheaded women with tape over their mouth. And she had to go into hiding and she was fired from her job too. He got another job straight away and she was out of a job for years. So that's the story, and that's where I told the story. When my New York Times article came out, some people 
said that I didn't explain that Adria had it worse than Hank, but I did explain that Adria had it worse than Hank. Um, I most certainly explain it in the book. Some people thought that the way that the New York Times extract was abridged meant that I didn't put enough emphasis on how Adria had it worse than Hank. Um, but most certainly in the book, I explained that very clearly. So I didn't quite understand the criticism, to tell you the truth, because I felt the thing they were accusing me of not doing, I did do. The book is very clear about who has it worse. And the book is very clear about the gender differences, that, that women, the range of insults is way worse than when, it's, when it's a woman being shamed than a man. So, so a small group of people tried to get the book on that, saying that I didn't understand the gender differences, but the book is absolutely full of me understanding the gender differences. So again, I, I felt that some people had an agenda you know, to go for the book in a way that just wasn't fair or true. And quite honestly. Um, and there's one other thing I wanted to say about that, which I can't recall what it is now. Okay. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Um, look for another question now. Um, if we could go, please, to the gentleman uh, that, yeah, with the glasses. Yeah, hi. Um, hi. I was interested in what you were saying about on the internet, in the internet world, we surround ourselves with people who share our own point of view and then screen other people out. And I notice there's a new trend for banning people, like a petition to ban Donald Trump mm. from visiting this country, um, stopping Jermaine Greer talking at universities, for supposedly politically correct reasons. But I just wondered if you, if you thought there were parallels between those two recent trends. Huh. Um, you know, I have, I, the reason, I, I was only half listening to your question, and the reason why I was only half listening to your question was because I just remembered the, the, the thing I wanted to say to the... <laughs> The other thing I wanted to say to the previous person, so do you mind if I just say it? Um, I just heard something really interesting the other day. Um, I'm mean, very sad, but interesting. Um, the, the range of insults when a woman is being shamed is way worse, but statistically, I, I'd always heard that men were more likely to commit suicide than women um, when in a situation like that. But then somebody, I said that at a talk the other day, and somebody came up to me afterwards and said that she works in that field, and actually suicide attempts are equal between men and women, but men choose more violent means who are more successful at committing suicide. So I just thought, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, should we... Do you mind repeating your question? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, about bandness. Yeah, okay, so, well, there's a little, you know, I mean, personally, I, I think, or, you know, I don't feel this is what this book is about, but personally, I, I, I think people are getting possibly, you know, some people are getting a, a little bit too, you know, the, in the universities, not wanting various comedians to talk, and, or, you know, writing letters to Jerry Seinfeld saying, you should only come and talk in our university if you're responsible, like Amy Schumer, and then Amy Schumer gets shamed, you know, everybody just gets shamed all the time, and, and my personal view is that, ah, you know, God said, you know, it's, it's fine, um, but that's a different matter to what this, this book's about. Thank you for your question. Um, we've got no another question here. If we go right across the other side, um, yeah, the guy's kind of waving. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, my, obviously the people that are featured in the book are all um, outside of the public eye and then have suddenly been shot to notoriety or fame. But I just wanted to know your thoughts on people who are already in the public eye who are then kind of faced with tons and tons of abuse. Like, yeah. I mean, a, an old example I, I was just thinking was when David Beckham got sent off in the World Cup years ago and then he came back and everyone was just going crazy but I mean there were hundreds of examples I'm sure but who were sort of in the public eye already yeah. but then take a lot as much if not more abuse from more people. Well I mean in, in this particular book I was more interested in private individuals um, because I just thought it, it's a special sort of hell for a private individual to, who, who, who makes a minor transgression and suddenly discovers that they're being held responsible for a systemic failure. Um, which doesn't negate the seriousness of whatever systemic failure, um, but it's still a very heavy weight to carry, the, the kind of burden of an ideology on your shoulders. Um, so I was really interested in that for, for this book. But, you know, public figures, it, it's, it's hard to... I, I, you know, personally, I'm more interested in 
in curiosity than in instant cold judgment. And I guess that goes for pretty much every story. Uh, I'm interested in curiosity. And, and I've noticed that curiosity and certainly, you know, um, waiting for evidence is now seen as a, as a weakness on social media. So, for instance, when Rachel Doljow was being attacked within minutes of anybody ever hearing her name for the first time, I tweeted something about how nobody, nobody knows anything about this person. And that was a shameworthy tweet. You know, lots of people went for me for saying, for saying I feel sorry for her, nobody knows anything about her. Um, I hope she's okay. A couple of weeks earlier, somebody had committed suicide in similar circumstances. Um, so, you know, calling for, waiting for evidence. If, if the night of the Justin Sacco thing, to tweet, can we not just wait till she lands to find out what she meant by that joke would have been seen as a shameable expression. That would, you know, all these things that are the basis of democracy, curiosity, waiting for some, to give somebody a chance to speak, those things are now seen as weaknesses. I think it's an interesting question, though, I, I, when you're talking about public figures and private figures. Do you think that public figures enter some kind of unspoken contract knowing that they're in the spotlight and if they do something... Well, yeah, I mean, response? my interest was very deliberately in private figures for this book. So, yeah, I mean, I have, I have less. And I certainly have, a, you know, very little sympathy for when somebody like Katie Hopkins is being shamed because she's, she's an agent provocateur and that's all part of the, the, the pantomime of it. Um, so that's a completely different matter, yeah. Very much so. Um, so we look at another question. I think we've got the time for one or two more questions. Um, if we could uh, just come right down here in the second row. Yeah. Hi, uh, you keep um, talking about these shamers as them. Are no, there any, us. Uh, or, or us even, yeah. do you think there are any characteristics that make people more drawn to this kind of behavior that you notice? Well, I mean, Everybody seems to do it. I, I do blame the technology to a large extent. I blame the feedback loop and this kind of mutual approval machine. That's definitely bringing it out in us. But I think, you know, pretty much everyone's prone to it. I mean, I've done it. I've shamed people. I've shamed, you know, I, I, in the early days of Twitter, I, I, was a, I was a keen, active shamer. Um, some academics created a spam, a John Ronson spam bot. Um, it was weird, actually. I, I went on Twitter one day and, and um, saw that there was this other John Ronson on Twitter with my face tweeting, I'm dreaming something about time and cock. Uh, <laughs> um, and it was being followed by people that I knew from real life, you know, who were obviously wondering why I was suddenly so candid about dreaming about cock. Um, so I, I, I interviewed them and put it on YouTube and they were horrendously shamed for it. Um, so even liberal anti-shaming me shames. Um, you know, you can, you can speculate about, um, you know, people having difficulties in their real life and, you know, people being shamed, then wanting to shame other people as a way, like a kind of, dod you know, piling shame onto shame, like some kind of dodgy builder covering cracks. I'm sure there's some truth to that. But, you know, it, it, Pretty much everybody succumbs to it on social media, as far as I can tell. Thank you for your question. Uh, we'll look for a, another question here. Um, if we could please go to um, the hand with the, the, the black top, it seems to be you also are wearing glasses. Thank you very much for your talk. Yeah. Um, so when people review your book, they often compare it to um, another one, Is Shame Necessary? Yes. Uh, that takes a far more optimistic stance and um, enlarges on the positive aspects of shaming to kind of take down power structures and challenge large companies, um, etc. that you Jennifer. mentioned. Um, do you think that kind of slightly more optimistic outlook um, is still valid now as opposed to back in the day that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk? Well, it's funny. Um, um, the author of Is Shame Necessary and I were invited to have it out on Channel 4 News. And, um, and they got quite excited and we both turned up and we both kind of agreed with each other and um, <laughs> you know I, I see, I see uh, the civil rights aspect of social media as being a very positive thing I mean what's happening with Oscars So White at the moment I think is great and important Black Lives Matter is great and important and, and in the same way she agrees Jennifer Jacket agrees that 
going after private individuals as some kind of cathartic alternative to social justice, some kind of performance piety, you know, is, is wrong. So we actually ended up ag really agreeing with each other. Uh, and that was very disappointing to Channel 4 News. So, and then something kind of interesting happened, which I feel bad about saying, but I will say it. And I, and I want to caveat this by saying, like, I love, I feel the same way about Jon Snow that everybody does. Like, I love Jon Snow. But... Jon Snow was clearly a little disappointed that me and Jennifer Jacket weren't going at each other um, because this is what, you know, confrontation makes the world go around and we weren't being confrontational. And so at one point, Jon Snow did this thing um, during the interview. This is my big memory of, of the interview. He said, well, what Justine Sacker said was clearly racist and then instantly turned his back to me so I never got the chance to respond. Uh, and then he talked to Jennifer Jacket for a minute, and then he turned back to me in the hope that I would have been riled enough to then say something outrageous, which would have made it a more interesting interview, uh, which I didn't do, because I was actually sitting there thinking, you know, not you, John. You know, it's kind of... <laughs> this kind of, um, you know, performance controversy, this kind of empty, meaningless performance controversy. You know, I, I felt very lucky that I don't need to do that. Yeah. Um, I think we've got time for one final question and uh, then we'll wrap up. Um, so, uh, yeah, I see a hand. We'll go right at the back. Uh, hi. Uh, what type of posts do you think uh, provoke the most, uh, well, explosive responses? Most explosive responses? Well, I think it's this. It's, it's being, I mean, I sort of feel like I answered that question. It's, 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 it's well, it's, it's, real or perceived misuse of privilege. That's, that's, that's the stuff, that's the most... And that's, of course, a much better thing to get people for than the stuff that we used to get people for, like having children out of wedlock. But, you know, it's a problem because it, it does harm getting people for, as I said earlier, some kind of cathartic alternative to social justice does damage not only to that individual, but I think it does damage to social justice. It does damage this very important thing that's happening at the moment. Um, so, I, so I think that's the answer. Well, thank you very much for your question, and thank you very much for all the questions. John, thank you very much for coming today. If you would all please remain seated as John leaves the chamber, but thank you very much for coming, John. Everyone, John Ronson. John Ronson.